Chapter Twenty One of Old Old Fairy Tales, Prince Cherry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. There was once upon a time a king, who was so praiseworthy and irreproachable in his conduct that his subjects called him King Good one day as he was hunting a little white rabbit being closely pursued by the hounds threw itself into his arms the king stroked the little rabbit and said since you have placed yourself under my protection i will not see you hurt he carried the rabbit to his palace and had a pretty little house made for it and gave it nice herbs to eat in the night while the king was alone in his chamber suddenly a beautiful lady appeared she wore neither gold nor silver but her gown was white as snow and her head was crowned with a wreath of white roses the good king was very much surprised to see this lady for his door was closed and he was puzzling himself to conceive how she had found an entrance when she said to him i am the fairy candid passing through the wood while you were hunting i was curious to know if you were as good as everybody says you are to ascertain this i assumed the shape of a little rabbit and took refuge in your arms for i was sure that he who would pity a little rabbit could not be unmerciful to his fellow-creatures while had you refused me your protection i should have concluded that with all your show of goodness you were wicked in your heart i am come to thank you for your kind offices to me and to assure you that i will always be your friend you may command me in all things within my power and i promise to grant you all you desire madam said king good since you are a fairy you ought to know all my wishes however i have an only son of whom i am very fond and who is called prince cherry if you have any affection for me become for my sake the friend and protectress of my son most willingly said the fairy i can make your son the handsomest the richest or the most powerful prince in the world choose whichever of these gifts you like best for him i desire none of them for my son answered the good king but i will be very much obliged to you if you will make him the best of all princes of what service to him would be his beauty or his riches or the possession of all the kingdoms in the world if he were wicked you know very well madam that he would notwithstanding be unfortunate and that it is the practice of virtue alone which can confer happiness you have well spoken said candid to the king but it is not in my power to make prince cherry a good man in spite of himself virtue must be attained it cannot be endowed or it ceases to be a virtue all that i can promise you is to give him good advice to point out his faults to him and to punish him if he will not correct and punish himself by repentance king good was very well satisfied with this promise and shortly afterward he died prince cherry wept very much for his father for he loved him with all his heart and would have given all his gold and his silver and all his kingdoms to have saved his father's life but who can change the course of fate two days after the good king's death as cherry was reclining on a sofa the fairy candon appeared to him i promised your father said she addressing herself to him to be your friend and to keep my word i am come to make you a present she then placed on cherry's finger a little gold ring and continued take great care of this ring it is plain but it is more precious than rubies more valuable than diamonds whenever you are about to commit a bad action it will prick your finger but remember that if in spite of its warnings you persevere in an evil deed you will forfeit my friendship nay i shall become your enemy as she finished these words candid disappeared and left cherry very much astonished and delighted with his present he was for some time so wise and good that the ring did not prick him at all which gave him so cheerful an air that to his name of cherry was added by his subjects that of happy 
after a while as he was one day hunting he was so unsuccessful as not to take anything whatever this put him in rather an ill humour and he thought that he felt his ring pricking his finger but so gently that he did not take much notice of it as he was returning to his chamber his little dog bibi ran as usual to meet him and leaped round him to be caressed but the prince said down sir i am not in a humour to play with you the poor little dog who did not understand him pulled him by his clothes to make cherry notice him at least this made cherry so angry that he gave the little dog a heavy kick when instantly the ring pricked him as sharply as if it had been a pin surprised ashamed and confused he seated himself in a corner of his chamber saying to himself surely the fairy is making sport of me for what great crime have i committed in kicking an animal that was teasing me to what purpose do i rule over a large empire if i may not even beat my dog i am not making sport of you said a voice in answer to the thoughts which were thus passing in cherry's mind you have instead of one committed three faults you first lost your temper because you cannot bear to be crossed even in trifles but think that men and beasts are made to obey you you next put yourself into a foaming passion with your dog who could not understand you which is very bad and lastly you were so mean-spirited as to be cruel to the poor animal who did not deserve ill-treatment i know that you are much above a dog but if it were reasonable and permitted for the great to ill-treat those who are beneath them i could at this very moment beat or kill you since a fairy is more powerful than man the advantage of being the ruler of a great empire does not consist in the power of committing all the evils to which we feel disposed but in the practice of all the good that lies within our power cherry though humbled and ashamed had not yet lost his candour he acknowledged his faults and promised to correct them he did not however keep his word he had been brought up by a foolish nurse who had spoiled him in his infancy if he wanted anything he had only to cry to fret or to stamp with his feet and that silly woman gave him all that he cried fretted or stamped for and thus had made him passionate and obstinate she had also told him from morning till night that he would one day be a king and that kings were always very happy because their subjects were bound to obey and to respect them and because no one could prevent their doing as they pleased however when cherry grew a little older and began to observe and reflect he became aware that nothing is so odious and particularly in the highest stations of society as to be proud haughty and obstinate he made some efforts to correct himself but he had contracted a bad habit of giving way to these faults and a bad habit is very difficult to overcome he had not naturally a bad heart he cried with vexation after committing a fault and would say how unfortunate am i to have thus always to oppose my anger and my pride if i had been corrected when i was young i should not now have so many vices to overcome his ring soon pricked him very often sometimes he stopped at its warning and at others continued his course in its despite and what is rather singular in the construction of the ring was that it only pricked him gently for a slight fault but when he was very wicked it actually drew blood from his finger at last growing impatient at its friendly severity and wishing to be wicked at his case he threw his ring from him he thought himself the happiest of men when he was thus freed from his admonisher he abandoned himself to all the folly that entered into his mind so that he became very wicked indeed and was the terror and the disgust of his subjects one day as cherry was walking in the fields he saw a young girl sitting by a brook so extremely beautiful that he at once resolved to marry her she was called zelia and was as wise as she was beautiful cherry accosted her thinking that zelia would esteem herself very happy indeed to become a great queen 
but to his astonishment she replied with much frankness to his addresses sire i am but a shepherdess and have no fortune but notwithstanding that i will never marry you is my appearance then displeasing to you asked cherry a little moved no my prince answered zelia i find you as you really are very handsome but of what use to me would be your beauty your riches the fine clothes the magnificent carriages that you would give me if the evil actions of which i should daily witness the performance should force me to despise and to hate you cherry went into a violent passion at this and commanded his officers to conduct zelia forcibly to his palace he was occupied all day with reflections on the contempt that she had shown for him but as he still loved her he could not determine to ill-treat her among cherry's favorites was his foster brother whom he had placed in his entire confidence this man whose inclinations were as low as his birth flattered his master's passions and gave him very bad advice on seeing cherry very sorrowful he asked him the subject of his grief and the prince having answered him that he could not endure zelia's contempt and that he was resolved to correct his faults as it was necessary for him to become virtuous to please her that wicked man said to him you are very good really to be willing to constrain yourself for the sake of a little girl if i were in your place i would compel her to obey me remember that you are king and that it would be a disgrace for you to submit to the caprice of a shepherdess who should be too happy to be admitted into the number of your slaves make her fast on bread and water put her into prison and if she remain adverse to marrying you put her to a cruel death and thus teach others to yield to your wishes it would be disgraceful were it known that a simple shepherdess could turn you from your course or resist your inclinations on that day will all your subjects forget that they are born only to attend on you but said cherry shall i not be disgraced if i put an innocent person to death for after all zelia is guilty of no crime no one can be innocent who refuses to yield to your wishes replied the confidant but supposing that you committed an unjust action even that would be better than that it should be said you allowed any one to show you a want of respect or to contradict you the courtier attacked cherry on his weak side and the fear of seeing his authority diminished made so much impression on the king that he repressed his first impulse to correct himself he resolved to go that same evening to the room in which the shepherdess was confined and not to spare her if she still refused to marry him cherry's foster brother who still feared the force of some good inclination assembled three young lords as wicked as himself to carouse with the king they supped together and took care quite to overturn this poor prince's reason by making him drink very deeply they artfully excited his anger towards zelia and made him so ashamed of his weakness toward her that he rose from the table like a madman and swore that he would at once make her obey him or that she should be sold the next day for a slave on entering the shepherdess's room cherry was very much surprised not to find her therein for he had kept the key in his pocket he went into a terrible rage and vowed vengeance on all whom he suspected of having assisted her escape his confidants hearing him talk thus resolved to take advantage of his anger to sacrifice a lord who had been cherry's guardian that good man had sometimes taken the liberty of telling the king of his faults for he loved him as his son at first cherry thanked him he gradually however grew impatient at his remonstrances and at last thought that it was in the spirit of opposition only that his guardian found fault with him when everybody else praised him he ordered him to withdraw from the court but notwithstanding that order he would say from time to time that he was a good man and although perhaps he no longer loved him 
he could not help esteeming him in spite of himself the confidence therefore were continually in fear lest he should take it into his head to recall his guardian and they believed that they had now found a favourable opportunity to get rid of him for ever they gave the king to understand that suleiman which was his worthy guardian's name had boasted that he would set zelia at liberty and three men were induced by rich bribes to say that they had heard suleiman affirm as much the prince in a transport of rage ordered his foster-brother to dispatch soldiers to fetch his guardian chained like a criminal after giving this order cherry went out into the grounds of the palace and threw himself on the grass feeling very miserable almost directly afterward he heard the sound of a horse's hoofs and the fairy candid appeared on a white steed i promised your father said she to him in a severe voice to give you good advice and to punish you if you refuse to follow it you have treated my counsel with contempt you still preserve the outward appearance of a man but your crimes have changed you into a monster the horror of heaven and earth it is now time that i entirely fulfil my promise to your father by punishing you for your guilt i condemn you to become like unto the beasts whose inclinations you have adopted you have made yourself like the lion by your anger like the wolf by your gluttony like the serpent by outraging him who was your second father like the bull by your ferocity bear then in your form the character of all these animals the fairy ceased to speak and cherry saw with horror that her sentence was accomplished he had a lion's head a bull's horn a wolf's feet and a serpent's tail in a moment he found himself out of the grove and in a large forest on the border of a rivulet in which he saw reflected his horrible transformations he heard a voice saying behold and reflect on the condition into which your crimes have reduced you your soul is a thousand times more frightful than your body cherry recognized the voice of the fairy candid and in his fury turned round to spring upon and devour her had it been possible but he saw no one while the same voice continued i laugh at your weakness and rage i go to confound your pride by putting you in the power of your own subjects cherry thought that by removing from the rivulet he should lessen his troubles since he would no longer have his ugliness and deformity before his eyes so he penetrated into the wood but he had not advanced many steps when he fell into a pit that had but been dug to entrap bears in an instant the huntsman who had been concealed in the trees came down and having bound him in chains they conducted him to the capital city of his kingdom on the road instead of acknowledging that he had drawn this punishment on himself by his faults he cursed the fairy gnashed his chains between his teeth and abandoned himself to his fury as he approached the capital he perceived everywhere great rejoicings and on the huntsmen asking what had occurred they were informed that prince cherry who only took delight in tormenting his people had been destroyed in his chamber by a thunderbolt for thus it was believed the gods added their informants could no longer endure the excess of his wickedness and have rid the earth of the monster it was stated also that four lords his accomplices in crime thought to profit by his destruction and to share the empire between them but that the people who knew that it was by their evil advice that the king had fallen had cut them in pieces and had offered the crown to suleiman the good man whom the wicked cherry had wished put to death that worthy guardian of the late king has just been crowned said an old man and we celebrate the day as that of the kingdom's deliverance for he is virtuous and will restore peace and abundance to the land cherry groaned with rage at overhearing this discourse but it was much worse for him when he arrived at the large square before his palace he saw suleiman on a superb throne 
and heard all the people bless him and pray for his long life that he might repair the evils they had suffered under his predecessor when suleiman expressed by signs that he wished to be heard and thus addressed the multitude i have accepted the crown you have offered me said he but it is only to preserve it for prince cherry he is not dead as you believe him to be a fairy has revealed to me his destiny and perhaps you may yet see him some day as virtuous as he was in the early years of his reign alas he continued weeping flatterers seduced him i knew his heart it was formed for virtue and but for the poisonous discourse of those around him he would have been the father of us all detest his vices but pity his misfortunes and let us unite to pray the gods to restore him to us for my part i should be but too happy to bathe his throne with my blood could i but see him once again ascend it with such disposition as would make him fill it more worthily suleiman's words touched cherry's heart he then felt how sincere had been the fidelity and attachment of this good old man and for the first time since his punishment he felt remorse for his crimes softened by this good feeling he felt the rage that had agitated him gradually cool he reflected on the many crimes of his life and acknowledged that he was not punished so rigorously as he deserved he ceased to struggle in the iron cage in which he was confined and became as quiet as a lamb he was conducted to a large menagerie in which were kept all sorts of monsters and wild beasts and he was chained up among the rest cherry resolved that he would lose no opportunity of repairing his faults he therefore conducted himself very obediently toward the man who had the care of him this man was a ruffian and although the monster was very gentle yet he beat him without rhyme or reason one day as his keeper was lying asleep a lion having broken his chain sprang upon him to devour him cherry could not for a moment prevent a slight emotion of joy at seeing himself about to be thus delivered from his persecutor but he immediately repressed this feeling and anxiously regretted that he was not at liberty i would return said he good for evil by saving the life of this unfortunate no sooner had he thus determined than he saw his cage door open he sprang to the assistance of the man who was awakened and defending himself against the lion the keeper thought he was lost indeed when he saw the monster but his fear was soon changed to joy the beneficent cherry sprang upon the lion strangled it and crouched himself humbly at the feet of the man whom he had just saved penetrated with gratitude the keeper would have caressed the monster who had done him so signal a service but as he stooped he heard a voice saying a good action never goes unrewarded and at the same moment to his great surprise he saw but a pretty little dog at his feet cherry charmed at his metamorphosis leaped upon and caressed his keeper who took him in his arms and carried him to the king to whom he related the wonderful occurrence that had just taken place the queen charmed with his goodness wished to have the dog and cherry would have been very well contented with his new condition could he but have forgotten that he was once a man and a king the queen daily overwhelmed him with caresses but greatly feared lest he should grow larger than he then was she consulted her physicians who told her that to prevent his growth it was merely necessary to feed him on bread only and to give him but a fixed allowance of that poor cherry was thus in danger of dying with hunger but he felt that it was necessary for him to be patient one day directly after his bread had been given to him for his breakfast he took it into his head that he would go and eat it in the palace garden he took it in his mouth therefore and went straight toward a stream which he recollected as being a short distance from the palace but to his surprise the stream was no longer there and in its place he saw a large house the outside of which was brilliant with gold and precious stones 
he observed an immense quantity of men and women magnificently dressed all going into this house and from the interior he heard singing dancing and other indications of the good cheer that was to be found there but he observed that all those who quitted the house were pale thin covered with sores and nearly naked for their clothes were torn to tatters some fell dead as they crossed the threshold apparently entirely exhausted others remained stretched on the ground at a short distance from the door dying with hunger and a few only had sufficient strength to drag themselves away the poor creatures who were lying on the ground begged with tears for a morsel of bread from those who were going into the house but were passed by without even a look cherry observed a young girl who was trying to gather some grass to eat and touched with compassion said to himself i have a good appetite tis true but i shall not die of hunger before my dinner time and if i sacrifice my breakfast to this poor creature perhaps i may be the means of saving her life he resolved to obey this good impulse and put his bread into the young girl's hand who carried it with avidity to her mouth she soon appeared to be entirely restored and cherry transported with joy at having succored her so opportunely was thinking of returning to the palace when he heard loud cries it was zelia in the hands of four men who were dragging her toward the fine house and were about to force her therein cherry then regretted that he had lost the shape and powers of the monster which would have enabled him to rescue his zelia while as a weak dog he could only bark at her enemies and follow close at their heels he was driven away with kicks and curses but he resolved not to leave the place and to ascertain what became of zelia he upbraided himself with that beautiful girl's misfortunes alas said he to himself i am irritated against those who are now carrying her off but have not i committed against her the same crime and if the justice of heaven had not frustrated my intentions should i not have treated her with as much indignity cherry's reflections were interrupted by a noise which he heard over his head he saw a window opened and his joy was extreme at perceiving zelia who threw out of the window a plate full of victuals so nicely cooked that the very sight of them was enough to create an appetite the window was immediately closed again and cherry who had not eaten all day thought that he might as well take advantage of this opportunity he was just about to eat when the young girl to whom he had given his bread uttered a cry and taking him in her arms poor little animal said she touch not those tempting viands that house is the palace of luxury and all that comes from it is poisoned at the same time cherry heard a voice saying you see again that a good action does not go unrewarded and he was immediately changed into a pretty little white pigeon he remembered that this was the color of the fairy candid and he began to hope that she might yet restore him to her good graces his first wish was to go to zelia and rising in the air he flew all round the house he saw with joy that there was a window open but in vain did he fly all over the house he could not find his zelia there he resolved however not to rest until he should meet with her he flew onward for many days and having at last entered on a desert he perceived a cavern into which he entered conceive his joy zelia was seated therein by the side of a venerable hermit and was sharing with him his frugal meal cherry transported flew on to the shoulder of the shepherdess and expressed by his caresses the pleasure he felt at seeing her again zelia who was charmed with the little bird's gentleness softly stroked him with her hand and although she thought he could not understand her she told him that she accepted the gift that he had made her of himself and that she would always love him what have you done zelia said the hermit you have just pledged your faith yes charming shepherdess said cherry to her 
resuming at that moment his natural form the end of my metamorphosis depended then on your consent to our union you have promised to love me always confirm my happiness or i will conjure the fairy candid my protectress to restore me to that form under which i had the happiness to please you you need not fear her inconstancy said candid who quitting the figure of the hermit under which she had been concealed appeared in her proper person zelia loved you when first she saw you but your vices obliged her to conceal from you the passion with which you had inspired her the change that has taken place in your heart allows her to give way to your tenderness you will live happily together since your union will be founded on virtue cherry and zelia threw themselves at the fairy candid's feet the prince could not sufficiently thank her for her goodness and zelia enchanted to learn that the prince had abandoned his errors confirmed to him the pleasing confession of her love rise my children said the fairy to them i will transport you to your palace i will restore to cherry a crown of which his vices had rendered him unworthy she ceased and cherry found himself with zelia in the chamber of suleiman who charmed to see his master return restored to himself and to his virtue joyfully advocated the throne and became again the most loyal of his subjects cherry and zelia enjoyed a long and happy reign and it is said of the prince that he thenceforward applied himself so zealously to his duty that the ring which he had recovered with his form never pricked him again so as to draw blood end of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two the princess maya this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the old old fairy tales by laura valentine the princess maya once upon a time there lived a king and queen who had several children but who had lost them all which gave them much sorrow for they had more estates than were necessary for themselves and they only wanted children it was five years since the queen had had her last and everybody thought that she would have no more she was greatly afflicted thinking of her pretty little princes who were dead but at last the queen was consoled by having another little baby it was proclaimed with the sound of trumpets and large placards in all the public places that the best nurses were to present themselves before the queen that from among them she might choose one for her baby they soon began to pour in from all four quarters of the world no one was to be seen but nurses and their babes one day the queen took an airing in a large wood and seating herself near the king she said sire let us assemble all the nurses and select one for our baby with all my heart my dear said the king and immediately gave the order for them all to be summoned the nurses all came one after another made a nice curtsy to the king and queen and placed themselves in a row each against a tree after they had thus arranged themselves and their healthy looks and fine teeth had been admired an ugly young woman sitting cross-legged with her knees as high as her chin in a kind of barrow drawn by two dirty little dwarfs made her appearance she had a large hump on her back squinted shockingly with both eyes and her skin was somewhat blacker than ink she held in her arms a little monkey and she spoke a jargon that no one understood she came in her turn to offer herself but the queen repulsed her go ugly creature she said to her you are very ignorant to come before me as you are if you remain there any longer i will take good care to have you removed the ill-looking creature passed on grumbling very audibly drawn by her frightful little dwarfs she settled herself in the hollow of a large tree when she could see all that passed the queen thinking no more about her chose a nice-looking nurse 
but directly she had named her, behold, a horrible serpent which was hidden in the grass stung her in the heel, and she fell down like one dead. The queen, very sorry for this accident, chose another. Immediately an eagle flying in the air came in sight, carrying a tortoise. He flew directly over the poor nurse, letting the tortoise fall on her head, which crushed her to atoms like a glass. The queen, still more grieved, named a third, who, coming forward a little quickly, stumbled over a bush full of long thorns and knocked one of her eyes out. Ah, cried the queen, my affairs are attended with much misfortune today. I cannot choose a nurse without bringing ill luck upon her. I will leave the care of it to my physician. As she was rising to return to the palace, she heard a very hearty laugh. She looked round and saw behind her the vile humpback, who was seated in her barrow like a monkey with her cub in her arms. She mocked all the company, and at the queen in particular, who, as you may suppose, was so vexed at this, that she felt inclined to run up to her and beat her not doubting that she had been the cause of all the mishaps which had befallen the nurses. But the humpback, having made three strokes with her wand, the dwarves were transformed into winged griffins, the barrow into a chariot of fire, and away they flew in the air uttering menaces and loud cries. Alas, my dear, we are lost, said the king. That is the fairy Carabosse. The malicious creature has hated me ever since I was a little boy, because I once, in a frolic, put some sulphur in her broth, and ever since that time she has been seeking an opportunity to revenge herself. The queen began to weep. If I had known her name beforehand, said she, I would have tried to make a friend of her. I wish I were dead. When the king saw the queen so afflicted, he said, my love, let us consult on what we had better do. He then raised her and supported her in his arms to the palace, for she was still trembling from the effect of the fear which Carabos had caused her. When the king and queen were in their room, they assembled their council. The doors and windows were carefully shut, that the result of their deliberations might not be overheard and it was resolved to invite all the fairies who lived within three thousand miles to the palace. Couriers were dispatched immediately, bearing letters very civilly written and fairly conceived, requesting them to come and see the baby, but asking them to keep the affair secret, for it was feared that it might reach Carabosa's ears, and that she might come and create a disturbance. As recompense for their trouble, they were promised a blue velvet kirtle, an under petticoat of purple velvet, slippers of slashed crimson satin, and a small pair of gilded scissors, all as well as a full case of fine needles. When the couriers had departed, the queen began to work with her maids of honour and her attendants to make all that had been promised for the fairies. She knew several but only five or six of them came. As soon as they arrived, they hastened to shut themselves up in a room to endow the little princess. The first gave her perfect beauty, the second infinite wit, the third endowed her with the gift of singing to perfection, the fourth with a talent for writing both in prose and in verse. As the fifth was about to speak, a rumbling noise was heard in the chimney similar in sound to that which a stone would make in falling down a steeple, and Carabos appeared, covered from head to foot with soot, crying in a loud voice, I endow this little creature to be more unlucky than any alive until she is aged four times five. At these words the queen, who was in bed, began to cry and to entreat Carabos to have pity on the little princess. All the fairies entreated her. Alas, sister, said they, recall so bad a gift. What harm can she have done you? But the ugly fairy would not answer a word, so that the fifth, who had not yet spoken, 
tried to mend the matter by endowing her with a long and happy life when the time of the malediction should have expired carabosse only laughed at her and sang taunting songs all the time she was reascending the chimney by which she took her departure the fairies all remained in consternation and the poor queen was more particularly astounded she did not fail to give them what she had promised augmenting the gifts by ribbons with which they were very pleased they were also well feasted and the eldest of them said that it was her advice that the young princess until she should be twenty years old should be confined in some space where she would not see any one except the women who attended her and that she should be closely guarded thereupon the king caused a close tower to be built in which there was no window there was no light in it except that shed by wax tapers it was reached by a subterraneous passage which extended three miles underground and by that passage the governesses and nurses had what they required brought to them at every twenty steps was a large door very securely fastened and guards were stationed the whole length of it the young princess was called maya because in her complexion were combined the hues of the rose and the lily she was more blooming and more lovely than the spring in that delightful month whose name she bore she was admirable in whatever she said or whatever she did she mastered the most abstruse sciences as well as the most graceful accomplishments and she grew so tall and beautiful that the king and queen never saw her without weeping for joy she sometimes requested them to stay with her or take her away with them for she was melancholy without knowing the reason why but they always deferred yielding to her request her nurse who had never quitted her and did not want talent sometimes told her how the world looked outside her tower and she understood her as well as though she had made the grand tour the king often said to the queen my dear carabos will be deceived we are more cunning than she is our maya will be happy in spite of her prediction and the queen would laugh till tears came into her eyes at the thought of the wicked fairy's defeated malice they had maya's portrait taken and sent copies of it all over the world for the twenty years were now near their expiration and they wished to marry her four days only were wanting to complete the period the court and the city made great rejoicings in honour of the approaching liberation of the princess and they were augmented by the news that the king merlin wished to contract her to his son and had dispatched his ambassador fanfarinet to ask for her hand the nurse who informed the princess of everything that occurred told her this adding that no sight could be more beautiful as fanfarinet's entry ah oh, how unfortunate i am she cried to be detained in a gloomy tower as though i had been guilty of some great crime i have never seen the sky the sun or the stars of which such wonders are related i have never seen a horse a monkey or a lion excepting in a picture the king and queen say they will liberate me when i shall be twenty years old but they wish to amuse me to make me patient and i know very well that they intend to allow me to die here although i have not offended them in any way thereupon she began to cry so vehemently that her eyes swelled as large as walnuts and her nurse and foster sister with her two other attendants who were all passionately fond of her began to cry also so abundantly that nothing but sobs and sighs could be heard so bitter was their grief that it nearly stifled them when the princess saw them so opportunely afflicted she took a knife and said aloud i am resolved to kill myself immediately if you do not find a means of letting me see fanfarinet's splendid entry the good king and queen will never know anything about it consider whether you would rather that i should kill myself now directly or whether you will indulge me in this wish at these words the women began to cry again still more bitterly and they at last determined to indulge her in a sight of fanfarinet or die in the attempt 
they passed the remainder of the evening in proposing and rejecting expedients and maya who was in despair said accordingly do not attempt to make me believe that you love me if you loved me you would soon find the means i have read that where there is a will there is a way at last they concluded that they would make a hole in the wall of the tower nearest the city by which wall fanfaronet was expected to pass they removed the princess's bed and they immediately set to work not leaving of day or night by dint of scraping and scraping they made a hole through the plaster and then took out two or three stones presently they displayed so many that they had made a hole large enough to pass a small needle through with much difficulty through that hole maya perceived daylight for the first time it dazzled her eyes and as she looked continually through it she at last saw fanfaronet appear at the head of his company he was mounted on a white horse which was curveting to the sound of trumpets and leaping admirably six flute players went in front playing the prettiest airs of the last new opera and six hoboys re-echoed in answer to the flutes then the trumpets and kettle drums made a loud noise fanfaronet wore a rich suit covered with embroidery and pearls with golden boots scarlet feathers abundance of ribbons and so many diamonds for king merlin who had rooms full of them as made him so dazzling that the sun itself was less brilliant at this sight maya was so beside herself with joy that she could look no longer and after reflecting a few minutes she vowed that she would marry no one but the handsome fanfaronet that there did not seem to be any chance of his master being half so amiable that she was not ambitious that if she had resided so comfortably in a tower she could live just as comfortably if it were necessary in a castle in the country with fanfaronet that to her mind bread and water with him were more preferable to the richest delicacies with any one else in a word she said so much about him that her women were puzzled to think where she had learned a quarter of it and when they were going to explain his rank and the wrong she was about to do herself she made them hold their tongues and would not deign to listen to them when fanfaronet had arrived at the king's palace the queen sent to fetch her daughter all the streets were carpeted and ladies were at their windows some held baskets full of flowers others baskets full of pearls and what was better excellent sweetmeats to scatter over her as she passed they had begun to dress her when a dwarf mounted on an elephant arrived at the tower he came from the five good fairies who had endowed her on the day that she was born they sent her a crown a sceptre a gold brocade robe a petticoat made of butterflies wings of admirable workmanship and a little strong box still more admirable for it was full of precious stones it was said that this box was beyond price and that wealth so immense was never before seen together at this sight the queen nearly fainted away with joy with regard to the princess she was indifferent enough to it all thinking only of fanfaronet they thanked the dwarf he had a pistole given to him to get something to drink and more than a thousand yards of narrow ribbon of various colours with which he made himself fine gaiters a tie to his cravat and a bow to his hat the dwarf was so little that when he had all the ribbons on his body was no longer visible the queen told him that she was considering what nice present she should send the fairies and the princess who was very generous made them presents of several large spinning wheels with cedar wood distaffs the princess was attired in all the rarest presents that the dwarf had brought she appeared so exceedingly beautiful to every one who saw her that the sun seemed to hide himself in dudgeon and the moon who is not too bashful dared not show herself while maya was on the road she traversed the streets on foot walking on the rich carpets the people assembled around her in crowds crying ah how beautiful how beautiful she is as she was going along dressed in this pompous apparel surrounded by the queen and four or five dozen princesses of the blood royal without reckoning more than ten dozen who had arrived from the neighbouring states to assist at the ceremony 
the heavens began to darken the thunder began to roar and the rain mixed with hail fell in torrents the queen put her royal mantle over her head and every lady did the same with her petticoat maya was about to do likewise when in the air were heard more than a thousand rooks screech owls and ravens with other birds of ill omen who by their foreboding noises augured no good at the same moment a dirty owl of prodigious size came hovering low in the air bearing in his beak a spiderweb scarf embroidered with bats wings he dropped this scarf on maya's shoulder and at that instant loud peals of laughter were heard significant enough that what had just taken place was one of carabosa's tricks at this melancholy spectacle every one began to weep and the queen more afflicted than any one else tried to snatch away the black scarf but it seemed nailed to her daughter's shoulders ah said she this is a manoeuvre of our enemy nothing will conciliate her i have fruitlessly sent her more than fifty pounds of sweetmeats as much sugar candy and two mayon's hands but she has taken no notice of my presence while she was lamenting the company were getting wet through maya giddy with the thoughts of the ambassador went on and without saying a single word she felt that provided she could please him she cared for neither carabos nor the ominous scarf she was beginning to feel surprised within herself that he did not come to meet her when all at once he appeared by the king's side the trumpets drums and violins immediately struck up a lively air and the shouts of the populace redoubled in a word the joy seemed universal fanfaronet had much wit but when he saw the beautiful maya with so much grace and dignity he was so enraptured that instead of speaking he could only stammer he looked like one tipsy although he had only taken a cup of chocolate he was in despair at forgetting in the twinkling of an eye an harangue which he had repeated daily for many months past and which he knew well enough to say off-hand when he was asleep while he was racking his memory to recall his intended oration he continued bowing low to the princess who on her part curtsied half a dozen times without reflection after a while she spoke and to divest him of the embarrassment she saw he was in she said my lord fanfaronet i can read in your eyes that your thoughts are agreeable i give you credit for having so much wit but let us hasten to reach the palace it is pouring with rain and it is the wicked carabosse who is thus inundating us when we are under cover she will be duped he replied gallantly that the fairy had wisely foreseen the fire that her beautiful eyes were so certain to kindle and to assuage it had kindly sent deluges of water after saying these few words he presented his hand to walk by her side she said in a low voice i feel for your sentiments that you would never divine were i not to explain them to you it is not without pain that i do it but evil be to him that evil thinks know then sir ambassador that i saw you with admiration mounted on your fine prancing horse and regretted that you had come hither on the part of another instead of your own we will not fail however if you have as much courage as i have to find a remedy for this instead of marrying you in your master's name i will marry you in your own i know that you are not a prince but you deserve to be one and you please me as much as though you were we will hasten together to some retired spot in the world it will be talked about at first and then someone else will do the same as i shall have done or perhaps worse and i shall be left in peace while they talk of the others and shall enjoy the pleasure of living with you fanfaronet thought that he was dreaming for maya was so beautiful a princess that excepting by a strange capri on her part he would never have hoped for this honour he had not even the strength to reply had they been alone he would have thrown himself at her feet as it was he took the liberty of pressing her hand so warmly that it hurt her little finger though she did not cry out so much did she dote upon him when she had entered the palace a chorus of all kinds of musical instruments struck up which was seconded by almost celestial voices so charming that one hardly dared to draw one's breath for fear of making too much noise after the king had kissed his daughter on the forehead and cheeks 
he said to her my dear little lamb for he called her all sorts of fond names should you not very much like to marry the great king merlin's son here is lord fanfaronet who will be proxy for his master in the ceremony and then will conduct you to the fairest kingdom in the world yes indeed father said she making a low curtsy i am willing to do whatever you like provided that my dear mother consents to it also i consent my darling said the queen embracing her come let dinner be served it was done with all due diligence there were a hundred tables spread in a long gallery and never till then had such a feast been made in the memory of man though maya and fanfaronet thought of nothing but each other and were in such deep reveries that they quite forgot to eat when dinner was over there was a ball a ballet and a play but it was already so late and the company had eaten so heartily at dinner that in spite of their efforts they all went to sleep standing the king and queen overpowered with slumber threw themselves on a settee most of the ladies and gentlemen snored the musicians ceased to keep time and the performers knew not what they said our lovers alone being awake speaking with their eyes a thousand unutterable things the princess seeing that she had nothing to fear and that the guards were all asleep on the straw beds in the tower said to fanfaronet trust to me let us take advantage of so favourable an opportunity for i expect that after the nuptial ceremony the king will give me ladies to wait on me and a prince to accompany me to your king merlin we had better therefore hasten away as quickly as we can maya rose and took the king's poniard which was set with diamonds and the queen's diadem which she had taken off her head to sleep more at ease she gave fanfaronet her white hand to lead her out he took it and kneeling on one knee i swear said he an eternal fidelity and obedience to your highness noble princess you are doing everything for me what would i not do for you they quitted the palace the ambassador carried a dark lantern and after threading several dirty streets they reached the shore and entered a little boat in which a poor old waterman lay asleep they wakened him and when he saw maya looking so beautiful and wearing so many diamonds and the spiderweb scarf he thought she must be a goddess of the night and kneeled before her but she had no time to amuse herself and ordered him to push off at once this was running a great risk for neither the moon nor the stars were visible the weather was still gloomy after the rain that carabosse had sent it is true that there is a carbuncle on the queen's headdress which was brighter than fifty lighted torches so that fanfaronet it is said could very well have done without the dark lantern they had also with them a stone which could make them invisible fanfaronet asked the princess where she wished to go alas said she i wish to go with you that is all that i have in my mind but madame said he i dare not conduct you to king merlin's kingdom for we should there be infallibly discovered well then replied she let us go to the isle of squirrels it is far enough off for us to be safe from pursuit she directed the mariner to put out to sea and although it was a small boat he obeyed when it was nearly daylight the king the queen and all the company having shaken themselves a little and rubbed their eyes began to think about concluding the prince's marriage the queen quickly asked for her rich diadem to dress her head but it was of course vainly sought after on all sides the king on his part wished to buckle on his brilliant poniard a search for it was immediately commenced all around and a number of coffers and strong boxes were opened of which the keys had been lost for more than a hundred years in some of them lots of wonderful curiosities were found dolls which moved their heads and opened and shut their eyes golden sheep with little lambs by their sides candied citron peels and sugar almonds but all these would not console the king his despair was so violent that he tore his beard and the queen kept him company by tearing her hair forsooth to say the diadem and poniard were more valuable than ten cities as large as madrid 
When the king saw that there were no hopes of finding either the diadem or the poniard, he said to the queen, My love, let us take courage and hasten to finish the ceremony which has already cost us so dearly. He asked, therefore, for the princess, when her nurse, stepping forward, said, I assure your majesty that I have been looking for her more than two hours and cannot find her. These words filled the cup of the king and queen's grief. The latter began to cry like an eagle whose young ones had been carried off and swooned away. They had the greatest difficulty in the world to recover her. The maids of honor and the young ladies wept, saying, What, is the princess then lost? To complete the misfortune, the king was informed that the ambassador Fanfaronet had disappeared also, which last blow overwhelmed the majesties with affliction. The king summoned all his counsellors and men-at-arms. He and the queen entered a large saloon, which had been promptly hung with black. They had taken off their fine clothes and had each put on a mourning robe. When they were seen in this state, there was not a heart so hard that it was not ready to break. The saloon resounded with sobs and sighs. At the end of a few minutes, the king said, my friends i have lost my dear daughter maya the queen's diadem and my poniard which were worth an empire have disappeared with her as likewise the ambassador fanfaronet i am sorely afraid that when the king his master hears the news he will come to seek him among us and that he will accuse us of having had him put to death still i would have patience if i had money but i confess to you that the wedding expenses have ruined me consult then my dear subjects on what i must do to recover my daughter and fanfaronet everybody admired the king's fine harangue he had never been so eloquent before lord gambilla chancellor of the kingdom rose and said sire we are all overwhelmed by the misfortune which has happened to you and we would have willingly sacrificed even our wives and little children to have averted such a terrible calamity it is doubtless a trick of the fairy carabos the princess has not yet completed her twentieth year and since it must be said i remarked that she was continually looking at fanfaronet and that he looked as continually at her perhaps love had no small share in what has taken place at these words the queen who was very passionate interrupted him take care what you advance said she my lord gambilla Know that the princess is not at all likely to fall in love with Fanfaronet. I have brought her up too well. Hereupon the nurse, who had listened to all that passed, came and knelt before the king and queen, saying, I have come to inform you of what has happened. The princess was determined either to see Fanfaronet or to die. We made a little hole in the wall of her tower, through which she saw him and she immediately swore that she would marry no one but him at this news the grief was universal which all allowed that chancellor gambilla had great penetration the queen in violent anger scolded the nurse the foster sister and all the other attendants and wanted to have them strangled admiral epaulette interrupting the queen cried out let us hasten after fanfaronet no doubt that wretch has carried off our princess everybody clapped their hands answering yes hasten after him then while some went to sea others went from kingdom to kingdom beating drums and sounding trumpets when a crowd had assembled round them they cried he who wishes to earn ten thousand pieces of gold has only to give an intelligence of princess maya who has been carried off by fanfaronet they were invariably answered you must go elsewhere none of us have seen them those who pursued the princess by sea were more successful after a long voyage they observed one night something ahead which burned like a large fire they were afraid to approach it in ignorance of what it might be but all at once this light stopped at the desert isle of squirrels in fact it was the princess and her lover with the carbuncle that shone so brilliantly they disembarked and after giving a hundred gold crowns to the good man who had brought them they wished him good-bye and forbade him to say a word to any one the first objects that he fell in with were the king's vessels and he no sooner made them out than he tried to avoid them 
but the admiral perceived him and dispatched a boat after him the good man was so old and infirm that he was too weak to row away the boat soon came up with him and he was conducted to admiral epaulette who had him searched the hundred gold crowns were found on him quite new for money had been coined expressly for the princess marriage the admiral questioned him and to avoid answering he pretended to be deaf and dumb come said the admiral lash the dumb man to the mainmast and give him three dozen it is the best remedy in the world for dumb people when the old man saw that it was all in earnest he confessed that a young lady more celestial than human and an accomplished gentleman had commanded him to conduct them to the desert isle of squirrels at these words the admiral concluded that the princess was in his power he gave orders for his fleet to surround the island meanwhile maya fatigued by her voyage sat down underneath the trees fanfaronet lay at full length and supported his head on his hand but being hungry he did not sleep and presently said to her do you think madame that i can long remain here i see nothing to eat though you were more beautiful than aurora that would not be sufficient for me i must have something to eat i have long teeth and am very hungry what fanfaronet replied she is it possible that the marks of my friendship have made no impression upon you is it possible that you are not satisfied with your good fortune i am rather dissatisfied with my misfortune cried he would to heaven that you were still in your black tower handsome fanfaronet said she to him graciously i entreat you not to be angry i will search high and low perhaps i may find some fruit for you perhaps said he you may find a wolf who will eat you up the sorrowful princess ran into the wood tearing her fine clothes with the brambles and her fair skin with the thorns she was scratched just as if she had been playing with cats see what happens of falling in love nothing but evil ever comes of it after running far and near she sorrowfully returned to fanfaronet and told him that she could find nothing he turned on his heel and left her grumbling between his teeth their search the next day was equally fruitless so that they were three whole days without taking any food excepting leaves and a few mayflies the princess did not complain although she was the much more delicate of the two i should be contented said she to him were i alone suffering and i should not even regret dying with hunger provided that you were well supplied with good cheer i should be quite indifferent answered fanfaronet as to whether you lived or died provided i had wherewithal to satisfy my appetite is it possible rejoined she that my death would move you so little is this in accordance with your vows there is a wide difference said he between a man at his ease who is neither hungry nor thirsty and an unfortunate ready to die on a desert isle i am in the same danger said she and i do not complain complain indeed replied him roughly you have thought proper to leave your father and mother to ramble about and here we are in a pretty pickle but it is for love of you that i have done so fanfaronet she said offering him her hand i could very well have done without your love said he and thereupon turned upon his heel and left her again the beautiful princess fatigued beyond measure with grief began to cry so piteously that it might have softened a rock she sat down at the foot of a rose tree which was loaded with red and white roses after looking at them some time she addressed them as follows how happy you must be young flowers the zephyrs breathe upon you the dew moistens you the sun beautifies you the trees cherish you and your thorns defend you everybody admires you alas and must you be more happy than i this reflection made her shed so many tears that the foot of the rose tree was quite moistened by them she then saw with astonishment the rose bush begin to move the roses to open and heard the finest of them say to her 
if you had not fallen in love your fate would have been as enviable as mine love exposes his votaries to the severest misfortunes poor princess take from the hollow of yonder tree the honeycomb that you will find there but do not be so silly when you have got it as to give any of it to fanfarinet she ran to the tree uncertain whether she were awake or dreaming she found the honey and immediately took it to her ungrateful lover here is a large honeycomb said she to him i might have eaten it myself but i preferred to share it with you without thanking her or even looking at her he snatched it from her hand and ate it all up refusing to give her even the smallest piece he even added raillery to his brutality he told her that it was too sweet and would spoil her teeth with a dozen similar impertinences maya more afflicted than she had been seated herself under an oak tree and paid it a compliment similar to that she had made to the rose tree the oak tree moved with compassion bent down a branch to her ear and said it were a pity that you should die fair maya take that jug of milk into the wood and do not give a drop of it to your ungrateful lover the princess in astonishment looked behind her and saw a large jug of milk she then thought only of the thirst from which fanfarinet was suffering after eating full fifteen pounds of honey and so ran to him with the jug quench your thirst handsome fanfarinet said she and do not forget to leave me a drop for i am dying with hunger and thirst he readily took the jug from her and drank off the contents at a draught then throwing it on the ground he broke it in pieces saying with a malignant smile as you have had nothing to eat you cannot be thirsty the princess clasped her hands and raised her bright eyes to heaven ah she cried i have deserved it all this is a just punishment for having quitted the king and queen and for falling so heedlessly in love with a man whom i did not know and for having eloped with him forgetting of my rank and the misfortune with which i was menaced by carabosse she then began to weep more bitterly than she had ever done in her life and diving into the thickest part of the wood she sank through weakness at the foot of an elm on which a nightingale was perched singing melodiously cheer up said the nightingale to her and look in the bush you will find there excellent sweet meats and tartlets fresh from paris but do not be so impudent as to give fanfarinet any of them the princess did not need this caution she had not forgotten the last tricks that he had played on her and she was so hungry that she ate up all the tartlets the greedy fanfarinet having observed her eating flew into so violent a passion that he ran sword in hand his eyes sparkling with rage to slay her she hastily uncovered the jewel on her headdress which rendered her invisible and running away from him reproached him for his ingratitude in terms which showed sufficiently that she could not even then hate him in the meantime admiral epaulette had dispatched jack rattle in his straw boots king's messenger in ordinary to inform the king that the princess and fanfarinet had landed on the isle of squirrels but not knowing the country he would not effect a landing for fear of ambuscades at this news which made their majesties very glad the king sent for a large book every leaf of which was six ells long it was the masterpiece of a learned fairy and contained a description of all the world on consulting it he immediately ascertained that the isle of squirrels was uninhabited go said he to jack rattle and order the admiral in my name to land immediately it has been bad management on his part and on mine also to leave my daughter so long with fanfarinet directly jack rattle arrived at the fleet the admiral caused drums and kettle drums to be beaten trumpets to be sounded and the band to commence playing their hoboys flutes violins hurdy-gurdies organs and guitars they made such a desperate din for instruments of war and peace were heard all over the island the princess alarmed at this noise ran to her lover to give him her assistance 
their mutual danger speedily reconciled them keep behind me said she to him i will walk first with the invisible stone uncovered and will use my father's poniard to slay the enemy while you kill them with your sword the invisible princess advanced among the soldiers she and fanfaronet slew them without being seen nothing was to be heard but cries of i am dead i am dying the soldiers in vain fired their muskets they always missed their mark for the princess and her lover dived like ducks and the bullets passed over their heads at last the admiral grieved at losing so many men in so extraordinary a manner without even knowing who was attacking him or how to defend himself sounded a retreat and returned on board his vessels to consult on what next steps should be taken night was already far advanced the princess and fanfaronet had taken refuge in the thickest part of the wood she was so tired that she stretched herself on the grass and was falling asleep when she heard a low whisper in her ear save yourself maya for fanfaronet wishes to kill and eat you quickly opening her eyes she saw by the light of her carbuncle the wicked fanfaronet with his arm raised ready to pierce her bosom with his sword for seeing her so fair and plump and having a good appetite he was going to put her to death and eat her she did not hesitate as to what course she should take she softly drew her poniard which she had kept since the battle and she gave him so deadly a blow in the eye that it killed him on the spot die ingrate she cried receive this last favour as one that you have richly deserved be for the future an example to perfidious lovers and may your faithless heart never enjoy repose when her first burst of passion was over and she remembered the condition she was in she was almost as dead as he who she had just killed what will become of me cried she weeping i am alone on this isle the wild beasts will devour me if i do not die of hunger she was almost sorry that she had not allowed fanfaronet to eat her she sat down trembling and anxiously awaited the daybreak for she was afraid of the spirits and especially of the nightmare as she was leaning against a tree and looking in the air she observed at a great distance from the ground a handsome golden chariot drawn by six large tufted hens the coachman was a cock and a fat pullet with postillion in the chariot was seated a lady whose charms were more resplendent than the sun her clothes were embroidered with gold spangles and little ingots of silver maya saw another chariot drawn by six bats the coachman was a raven and the postillion a snail in it was a frightful little baboon dressed in a serpent's skin and wearing on her head a large toad which served her for a topknot never never was any one so surprised as was the princess she was considering how these marvels would end she observed the chariots advance one toward the other the fine lady holding a gilded spear in her hand and the ugly one a rusty spike in hers they commenced a fierce battle which lasted more than a quarter of an hour presently the handsome lady was victorious and her opponent hastened from the scene of action with her bats at the same time the handsome lady alighted and addressing maya said do not be afraid amiable princess i have only visited this isle to be of service to you the combat that i have just had with carabos has been fought for love of you she wished to gain the day that she might flog you for leaving your tower four days before the completion of the twenty years but you saw that i took your part and i have driven her away enjoy the happiness i have acquired for you the grateful princess prostrated herself before her many thanks great queen of the fairies said she your generosity overpowers me i do not know how to thank you but i feel that i have not a drop of blood that you have just preserved which is not at your service the fairy embraced her three times and made her still more beautiful than she had been were such a thing possible she ordered her cock to go to the king's vessels and tell the admiral to land without fear 
and dispatched her fat Paulette to the palace to fetch the finest clothes that were ever seen for Maya. When the admiral heard the news that the cock brought, he was so enraptured that he nearly went into a fever. He instantly landed on the isle with all his people. Jack Rattle, seeing the haste in which everybody quitted the vessels, joined the throng, carrying on his shoulder a spit loaded with game. Admiral Epaulette had hardly proceeded three miles up the country, when he perceived on a high road in the wood chariot drawn by hens the two ladies who were walking. He recognized the princess and hastened to throw himself at her feet, but he was stopped by Maya herself, who told him that all his homage was due to the generous fairy who had saved her from Carabosa's claws. So he kissed the hem of her robe and paid her the handsomest compliments that were ever pronounced on a similar occasion. While he was speaking, the fairy interrupted him and cried, I declare I smell roast meat. Yes, madam, answered Jack Rattle, showing her the spit loaded with nice game. It only remains for your highness to taste it. Then serve it up immediately by all means, said she. Less for me than the princess, who is in want of a good meal. Then all the other requisites were sent for from the vessels, and the joy of having found the princess joined to the good cheer left nothing to be wished for. The repast being over, and the fat Paulette having returned, the fairy dressed Maya in a robe of green and cloth of gold, spangled with rubies and pearls. She confined her fine hair with diamond and emerald bands, crowned her with flowers, and assisting her into her own chariot, all the stars who saw her pass took her for Aurora, though it was not then daybreak, and said to her as they passed, Good morning, Madam Aurora. After the most tender adieus between the fairy and the princess, the latter said, but, madame, must I not tell my mother, the queen, who it is that has done me such kindness? Beautiful princess, answered the fairy, embrace her for me, and tell her that I am the fifth fairy who endowed you at your birth. When the princess was on board the admiral's ship, a royal salute of upward of a hundred guns and a thousand rockets was discharged. She arrived safely in port and found the king and queen waiting for her with the utmost impatience. They received her with so many caresses that they did not give her time to ask pardon for her past folly, although she threw herself at their feet directly she saw them. Paternal kindness triumphed, and old Carabos was blamed for it all. At the same time, the son of the king Merlin arrived uneasy at not having received any news from his ambassador he had a thousand horses and thirty lackeys well dressed in scarlet and rich gold lace he was a hundred times more charming than the ungrateful fanfaronet care was taken not to inform him that the princess had been carried off as that might perhaps have given him offence he was told very plausibly that his ambassador, being thirsty and wishing to draw some water to drink, had fallen in the act of doing so into a well and was drowned. He easily believed it, and the wedding was celebrated so joyfully that it effaced the whole remembrance of the past sorrows. End of chapter 22 End of the Old, Old Fairy Tales by Laura Valentine